This is the Celtic Soul Podcast with me, Andrew Millen. On today's show, I will be talking to John Hartson, who will need no introduction to the Celtic fan base. His record of over 100 goals in the green and white of Celtic speaks for itself. Today's show has been kindly sponsored by St. Margaret's Celtic Supporters Club, and I would like to thank Hilly, Tommy and all the boys for their continued support. So what's been happening at Celtic since the last podcast? We've had our player of the year, young player of the year and goal of the season. And what a goal of the season it was. In Sham, in Rome, against Lazio. Possibly the best night I've had in an away ground in a long, long time. The celebrations, the session, the city will be remembered for a long, long time to come by all the Celtic fans who are there and all the Celtic fans who are watching on TV around the world. In Sham, there was talk of him going last season. So glad he stayed, and I hope he stays for the 10. Big Eddie, what can we say? Player of the year. Unbelievable, his goals. And this season, we look forward to him up front with Lee Griffiths. And then the young player, young Frimpom. What a find from Manchester City. Absolutely outstanding. And he's only going to get better. Another find and well done to the Celtic scouting system. It's always great to catch up with John Harrison, what a player he was and what a man. Great insight into life and great insight into football in general, as well as all things Celtic. So here's how I got on when I chatted to John earlier on. He's known to the Celtic fans as Big Bad John. John Harrison was signed by Martin O'Neill after failing a few medicals, including one at Rangers. At Celtic, he went on to win six trophies, numerous Player of the Year awards and scored over 100 goals including some very important ones on the road to Seville, not to mention a bag full against Rangers. Hello, John. You're very welcome to the Celtic Soul podcast. How has life been in lockdown? And are you back enjoying the golf course yet? Uh, I've got to say first, though, you mentioned the Rangers medical there. A certain Mr. Neil Lennon had trials with Rangers. Are you forgetting that? No, no. He mustn't have been good enough to play for him then, was he? Okay. Well, um, <laughs> that's a good boy level, but um, there you go. Uh, nobody mentions that one, but people are quite keen to mention my failed medical. But uh, no, I've not quite been on the golf course yet, Andrew. In Scotland, yeah, yeah, the golf courses have reopened, but the, it's only two balls at the minute. You only allow two. You're not allowed to play as a four. So I've got lots of golf lined up. Um, you know, when the time's right and everything else, but I've not quite been able to get a game yet. I'd be really knuckling down with my fitness. I've been doing a lot of cycling, a lot of uh, pad work with the boxing. Um, I've been doing some running. I've signed up for the Edinburgh Men's 10K on October the 25th, which is a Sunday. So I'm going to build up to that. It's 6.2 miles. I'm doing it for the Edinburgh Children's Hospital Charity. So um, in the next few days, I'll be speaking to somebody from that charity and setting up a GoFundMe page so um, I can start raising some money and uh, asking people for donations in terms of running the the 10K. And then, of course, um, with the GoFundMe page, you know, all the, the money that comes in will just go directly into the Edinburgh Children's Charity Fund which is really important. So um, I'll be doing that in the next few days. And it's just another challenge for me, really. I'm not big on the whole running, but um, I just feel I'm getting fitter, you know, as the weeks are going on. And I've just really knuckled down and got into my fitness. You know yourself, Andrew, there's no better feeling when you're slimmer, you know, when you're feeling better, when you get up in the mornings and all the aches and pains we used to have in getting older. You know, you can't help that, but they tend to get a bit easier if you get a little bit fitter and a little bit lighter and you start eating better. You know, all these things, um, they all come together, really, and and that's the situation I'm in right now. So I've I've really knuckled down on my fitness. Your your old pal, I was talking to Tomo about two weeks ago. He's back on the golf course and um, he's become a bit of a Twitter overnight sensation. Him and his little dog, Bobo. I know, but... uh, He's still waiting for his little blue tick, isn't he? <laughs> and to try and get him a little blue tick. He's like, right, what do I got to do to get this tick? And all the Celtic fans, well, we can get you a green tick, Tom. I'm not sure about the blue ticks and everything else. But no, you'll get one. You'll get one soon. I just think it's a case of uh, somebody recognising the fact that he's uh, 
he's an ex-footballer and I think I think he qualifies for, for a little check anyway. But uh, no, I like Tom Oak. He's a great player. As you were saying, we, you, yourself, me and Alan, we've enjoyed a few Celtic nights, um, you know, different charity functions in the last few years. And he was, he was a top player, Alan, and um, scored a lot of important goals for the football club. Of course, joined the staff as well. That probably didn't go as well as he would have liked. But, um, you know, Alan is a good friend of mine and uh, it's great to see him on Twitter. I never thought I'd ever see the day because he used to actually slaughter it. And what are you doing on that? What's that? What's that? But I got Chris Sutton on Twitter. I got Big Sutton into after dinner speaking. So there's a lot they need to thank me for then, boys. They do indeed, John. I had a couple of conversations with him on a Saturday night through WhatsApp. We've had a few distant drinks on a Saturday night, uh, especially early in the lockdown when, when there wasn't a lot happening. And I got some great stories out of him. But you know me, John, I don't kiss and tell. No, you don't. And the thing is, I've told Tom, or I've reminded him, never tweet when he's had a few drinks because you'll regret it the next day. 100%. You and and tabloids would love a bit of that. Oh, and you're saying things and you're reacting, you know, you're reacting to things that you'd normally just put away or put to the back of your head or even block food drinks down you like everything else. You know, you get a little bit braver, a little bit more boisterous. And I've told Alan um, when he's had a couple of scoops, <laughs> put, the, put the Twitter away. <laughs> that would be my advice to him anyway. John, um, football is slowly returning. And obviously you walk as a pundit. Have you any idea what, what games is it going to cover and how is it going to cover them? Will you be at the games? Will you be in the studio? Because it's bad enough for those fans. Yeah, I've not been told yet. I think they will have some representation of, of some commentators and co-commentators. There's plenty of games coming up, Andrew, and there's plenty of shows on, you know, down south with BT and there's plenty of stuff coming up now for the next five years with Sky. Sky have got the, the Scottish Premiership for the next five years they've taken over BT in terms of the, the football coverage here in Scotland they ploughed millions in uh, for the rights so it'll be interesting to see what, what type of team Sky put together uh, to cover them games but there's also there's loads of talk sports there's, there's radio there's local radio there's BBC and for pundits like myself who've made a career out of it in the last 10 years uh, I, I won't be short of, you know, games and offers and trips down to London where I'd have to get to certain games to cover. But uh, off the top of my head, I'm not quite looked at the plan yet. I'm not quite got into it in terms of speaking to directors and editors of these shows. But I'm anticipating being busy, certainly once the new season starts and over the next sort of six to eight weeks while... The Premiership has now got a, a resumption starting on the 17th, I think, which is Wednesday. Um, there's so many games. I think there's 72 games, if I'm right, to get through. Now, all of them, I'm not sure if all of them are live, but they are the amount of games that it, it's going to take. And, of course, you've got the Championship as well, which has got a resumption. And then it looks like the talk in Scotland coming back in August 1st, which I think... May happen, may not. This the virtual season book now, which has been a lot of controversy over. Selig are uh, working with the company that do BT stuff at the Europa League. So that might be an opening for the old BT crew to come back, who will be sadly missed, John, in Scotland. Because, and I'm not knocking Sky because they put the money in, but the punditry wouldn't be as strong or as entertaining as the BT crew. Well, with B3, you've got um, it's different um, editors, different directors, different bosses. They choose their team. Now, I wasn't really part of that team. Neither was Alan Thompson. Neither was one or two others. They chose Alec Ray. They chose Chris Sutton. They chose Gordon Strack. And they chose Ali McCoist. And that was their prerogative. They, they're quite entitled to choose who they want. And BT Sport were fantastic. You know, they're good, good lads. Um, it was good entertainment. So I don't know what, what Sky are going to do. Uh, obviously, Sunset and Vine, the company, might bring the same team back. But then you're looking at games. I think Sky then will be totally separate. So you'd have your Sky games and your Sky pundits. 
And then the games um, that you're talking about, Sunset and Vine, they were probably used the same crew to show the, the Celtic home games through, through a different channel. So obviously they did a great job, BT Sport, with the pundits that they chose. And as I said, I wasn't party to that, to that group. A um, couple of years ago, I did some European games for them, Champions, Champions Leagues and qualifiers and things like that. And then I, I seem to drift away from BT. If that's their prerogative to choose who they want to choose. Uh, they always put on great shows. You know, the guys that were on there, Stephen Cragen is another one. Daryl Curry was the presenter generally. And then you had Ailey Barber and one or two others then that would do Sky games. Um, so I, I think Sky will be putting a team together because they are ploughing in an awful lot of money, you know, for the rights. But um, I suppose a lot of the Celtic fans, you know, will be happy with um, with the fact that they might be able to get the BT group back together, covering more games. Just whether you've got Saturdays, I don't know what Ali McCoy says on a Saturday. I know Chris does a lot of BT down south. He does a lot of co-commentating. It's just whether you can get them guys on a Saturday afternoon. Because before, as you know, it was generally Sundays. It was midweek. Um, not many games on a Saturday. It was Friday nights, as you know. But um, I suppose it, it's good news for the people and the fans that liked that BT group of of, uh, of pundits. Yeah, Chris Orton, who ever would have thought when he was playing that he'd be the busiest man and he'd be on the speaking seg and on TV. I remember him doing his full speech and he was... Leo Lennon was slagging him off, and that's not that many years ago. I think he was he was just in management at the time, and he's yeah. just progressed unbelievably. Yeah, he has, and um, you know I like Chris. We we played together for three and a half years, um, might even be four years at Celtic. Obviously, um, you know we have a lot of respect for each other because of the the, the roles that we played. We were both centre forwards, both focal points you know, of the team, you know, we both scored our fair share of goals as well. So, you know, there's mutual respect there between me and Chris simply because of the roles we played and, you know, we, we played together, we played against each other. And I played Arsenal, Blackburn, and when he was down south, I West Ham, Blackburn, these type of games. So when I arrived at South, he, he did something extraordinary for me as well. He, he moved from centre forward to midfield and centre half to, to allow me to come into the team. You know, he never sulked about it. He never grizzled. He never went to see the manager. He said, look, John's a fine centre forward. And with the three of us in the team, I think, you know, he would have he would have welcomed the fact that you had Hearts and Sutton and Larson all in the same team. Um, and, and that made us stronger. But um, mainly that, that was to do with him being such a great professional. And um, I wouldn't say he was equally as good as centre half and midfield because I think his best position was centre forward. He'd won, a, he'd won a golden boot. He'd won a Premier League. He'd moved for £10 million to Chelsea. He, he played for England. So, you know, a lot of credit must go to Chris for not kicking up any fuss, you know, not saying he wanted to leave, not, not causing any mischief or, you know, any, any aggro between any, any of the, 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 the players or the manager. He, he never caused a scene. He just got on with it. And in the end, you know, we had, some, we had a really good run, especially that UEFA Cup run where Chris... We had a midfield of Lennon, Petrov and Sutton. And then myself and Henrik played right the way through that UEFA Cup run. And uh, I always say it, as much as Paul Lambert was a great player, Paul never played. Paul wasn't in that. Paul Lambert wouldn't have played in the UEFA Cup final if I'd have been fit. And uh, he ended up captaining the team because Chris would have played in midfield and I would have played up top with Henrik. Um, they were the two semi-final lineups. They were the two quarter-final lineups. They were all the way right the way through, and that's our system. You know, at Liverpool, it was me and Hendrick with the three midfielders. I think Lambo did play at Liverpool, actually. But um, that was our European system. That worked. And Chris played midfield all the way through that. And, of course, in the final, then he went up top with Henrik. But um, it was a shame, you know, I missed out on that final because I was flying that year. I got 25 goals. I got injured at Ibrox, of all places. And then also... I wasn't able to add to the goals that I got. And we ended up losing the, the league by a goal. Remember, down at uh, Kilmarnock. I don't want to mention Alan Thompson's missed penalty, by the way. 
<laughs> Everybody talks about my missed penalty in the cup final against Rangers. I know it's a different situation, but um, you know nobody mentions Chris Sutton's cup final penalty miss when we beat Dundee United. Nobody mentions Alan Thompson's penalty miss when um, when we were wanting goals down at Kilmarnock. Well, everybody reminds me of my penalty miss in the last minute of a cup final. But there we are. There we are. You get these things. You've got to deal with them. I'm just, I'm, I'm reliving some of them memories in my head. Uh, great, great front three up there. No better. What a season it was as well. I'm still paying back the loan to the credit union. But like, I, I, done, a, I done a live show with Chris recently and what you're saying about, you know, how he didn't sulk in that. A good team player and that just shows the respect that he and the rest he has had for Martin O'Neill. Absolutely, because you know what goes on in the dressing room and what goes on on the training ground, the fans are are, are unaware of what goes on uh, because a lot of it is kept in house and a lot of things were kept in house at Celtic because everybody trusted the group. You know, we had uh, that we had, we had a great understanding between us, all different types of characters, and very little come out of the dressing room. You know, you hear whispers of different clubs. Things go and tell people go and tell their agent, who goes and tells another agent, who then goes and has a, a tells one of his pals in the press. Next thing, it's in the newspapers, and you think, how on earth has that got out? But we were such a tight group of players. Um, Chris dealt with it, and as I said, he he could have gone. Well, look, you know, me and Henrik scored sixty six goals between us in the treble winning season, the first year that the Chris arrived. Wonderful partnership. And then I've got I've, John's arrived the following season. Martin's paid six million pounds for me. Chris could have gone. Well, hold on a minute. No, I'm, 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 I've got a great partnership here with Henrik. Things are working really well. We've just won a treble, but incredibly, we went on to be successful again from there. And as I said, I think the big thing was was that there's a school of thought, Andrew, that you get your best team, you get your best players in the team, you get all your best players in the team, and you work around the system. Mark Hughes played midfield for Wales because he had Rush and Saunders up top for Wales. Gary Speed played left back for Wales to allow other midfielders in the team. Sometimes if you've got a tremendous player or a goal scorer and he's sitting on the bench and you paid a lot of money for him, you know, it's like, well, can we not get him in the team? Can we not fit him in somewhere? But it was lucky that Chris was very versatile. He had a tremendous engine. He could run all day. Uh, he was very fit and he could slot in that centre half and he could slot in that midfield. And even when he was in the midfield, he still still went forward. And it was like, you know, sometimes I'd have to drop in or Henrik would drop in and Chris would stay up top. And, you know, we, we scored whatever, how many goals it was between us, you know, during during the five years that, that we played together. And um, I always say it was very special playing with them too. Because if, if Henrik weren't setting you up or if Chris weren't laying, on, laying it on the plate for you, I was, I was doing the same with them. We were all very unselfish. And we, we wanted one thing, and that was to win for Celtic. We, we just wanted to win for the football club. You know? And when you've got the likes of Petrov and Lambert and Lennon and Thompson and Gappy and, and Agat and these guys, other fantastic players, putting it on the plate for you most weeks, quality. It was a joy. It was a joy to, to have been played in that team and to have been a part of it. And it, it was a wonderful part of my football career and, and my my own football story, the Celtic one, as well as I've done some West Ham podcasts this week and I've done some Arsenal bits and bobs. But the five years I spent in Glasgow was, was, was magnificent. It was a great time, not only with my football career, but obviously with my, with my life as well. Celtic players are back in pre-season now. You must have some great stories about those long runs. Did you look forward to coming back? Or was it a case of, oh, I could do it another week off, a couple of points? Oh, Andrew, I was a nightmare because um, it, was a lo- it was very different when I was doing pre-season. We're talking, uh, you know, 15, 20 years ago. There wasn't much sports science. There was no heart monitors. It was just hard running. It was just going round the track, you know. Um, 1,500 metres, a couple of 800 metres, sprints, 400 metres. They'd take you to a local forest and they'd run you for seven or eight miles. Do 12, right? you don't, they, the guys now, they don't do an awful lot of long running. It's all very short and sharp stuff. Everything is measured. Everything is, you know, is looked at specifically 
distances they're covering, where their heart rate monitor is, are they in this red zone or whatever zones they're in, you know, all these type of things now. But what was different was years ago was whenever we finished, whenever we finished the season, we normally have five or six weeks off. And I had a place in Marbella. I had my own. I had my own place. It was like going from home to home. I had my golf clubs there. I had a car there. My wardrobe there. The kids had toys and everything. And we just go from home to home. Just jump on a plane, basically, and everything was there for us. And I knew I was always good for a stone. You know, if I'd, I, I quite enjoyed a few pints, and you know, I'd go out for dinner with the family. I'd go on golf days, you know, leave the family one or two days. With Shay Given would play, uh, Roy Evans would play, Tim Sherwood. We were all in the same sort of development in Marbella. And then the game of golf would end up, you know, a few pints afterwards. And then we'd be back with the wives and the kids and then we'd all be into Marbella, you know, down Porta Benoos, we'd book a table and all this time I'm doing a very little exercise but I used to use that period to enjoy myself. It's different now because the players, they'll still be enjoying themselves when they're off, but they've all got programs. They've all got fitness programs that they need to stick to. And a lot of players now, Andrew, come back even lighter. They work so hard and they're very professional. They work very, very hard on these programs that they're given at the end of the back end of the season. The players would have been given a program to keep fit. But I always used to use that four weeks then of pre-season training to get myself back to the same weight as what I was at the end of the season. You know, I could allow myself maybe a stone, maybe eight or nine pounds to put on. And then um, I would use the pre-season training then to get fit. You don't do that now, Andrew, because you've got so many, you've got Champions League qualifiers, you've got to come back almost ready to go because you've got qualifiers, you know, you've got other games, you've got cup games, whatever cups that you, you, you enter into. You know, the squad now is a lot more professional. I think, I think Neil and John Kennedy and, and Tim Williamson and, and these guys, you know, they're all very professional now, the football players. It's different to what it used to be like 10, 15 years ago. You could allow yourself a, a good few drinks in the, in the summer break. Lenny was the world's worst for it. He's now manager of Celtic. But Lenny used to love a little trip over to Portugal and, you know, with friends and everything else. And Neil would come back and he'd have the same attitude. You know, he'd, he'd put a few pounds on and then he'd work during pre-season to get rid of that. And the manager wasn't too bothered. As long as you weren't too heavy and as long as you got the weight off, you know, Martin was pretty much very old school in that sense because Brian Clough would have been like it. But nowadays, it's changed totally. The guys now are so professional. They're so fit. You look at footballers now, Andrew, and there's nothing on them, is there? They're all skinny. They're ripped. They're small. They're very. You don't see sort of any overweight players now. Don't see players carrying any weight in their shorts because of the sports science and the professionalism now. No Mickey Um, Quinns. No Mickey Quinns. No Matt Letitia's. No John Artson's. You know. Footballers now, uh, you know, are super professional. They look after themselves ever so well. Yeah, that, that brings me on. You mentioned Neil there, and as he prepares for the 10 in a row, it's going to be some achievement. We are favourites. We are expected to do it. But the previous time in the 70s, we did not do it. But I just want to go back to the nine in a row when the team came back from Dubai. And sometimes goes unnoticed how good of a tactician Neil is and his team because you know he masterminded when the night we beat Barcelona he was very very good as Hibs manager when he lined his teams out against Brendan Rodgers Celtic but I just think when he came back from Dubai and he changed the system and how the players come out of the traps we were just unstoppable then you, you were just so confident and then the opposite happened to Stephen Gerrard and his Rangers team yeah it was like both teams went to Dubai one team came back with a real hunger. Remember when we, when we lost that game, I hate to mention it, but I have to, you know, just before the turn of the year, we were two points ahead of Rangers and they had the game in hand. So they would have gone and they would have been, well, it's in our own hands. I don't know what happened to them. I'm not party what happened to that group of players over in Dubai, but I know a certain group of players 
and the management team went with a desire to come back after the break. And I know they worked hard in Dubai. I know they worked very hard. It wasn't a jolly up. It wasn't a holiday. Yes, Neil would have allowed them a night out here and there, a little bit of relaxation. And the guys would have probably had a curfew, a time to come in and everything else. There's no doubt about that. But there was one team that came back with a real hunger, a desire and and a will to go and win the nine in a row. And you could see straight away in terms of the performance, the players looked fresher. They looked sharper. You know, Neil had had gone to three at the back um, with the wing-backs. He tinkered around with the system. The way that the club dealt with Lee Griffiths, I think, is very, very commendable. I know Lee has an awful lot of respect for, for Neil Lennon. Neil gradually brought him back, you know, and I heard some few whispers, come on, play Griff, play Griff, you've got to play him, he's ready, he's ready, he's ready. No, Neil knows when he's ready. And Griff has to be patient. He was out for a while. He had some personal problems and fantastic. He's done really, really well to get over them now. He looks flying. He looks sharp. He looks ready to go again once the new season starts. But I don't think the whole club took enough credit, had enough credit for the way they dealt with that. You know, they did it their own way. They, they, they give Lee what he needed, the help the therapy or the, the, the practitioners he would have seen, the work that he would have done personally on himself, the work that he would have done behind closed doors on the training ground, which would have gone unnoticed because he was training till three or four o'clock in the afternoon when a lot of the other players had gone. His attitude was first class. And that's what Neil would have wanted to see. So Lee responded in the perfect way. The club handled the whole situation brilliantly. The lad needed help and the club stood by him. And I'm expecting Lee now to come back like a new signing. We all know his his talents. We all know what his strengths are. His his strengths are goal scoring. He is a goal scorer, a phenomenal front player who gets goals for fun. And if we can supply Lee with opportunities and chances, a fit and a hungry Lee Griffiths, it will be like a new signing for us, having him back, you know, looking at scoring 20, 25, 30 goals, which is not, which is a realistic target for him because that, that's what he'd expect to score himself. I think the two things that Celtic have to do, in my opinion, now I know we have an awful lot of very important players uh, in the squad, but the two names that, you know, I speak to a lot of people uh, living here in, in Scotland, um, or every day, I can't go to the garage to fill my car up with petrol without somebody asking me or telling me something or giving me advice. Worse than you, Andrew. <laughs> You're always, um, you know, the, one, the, one, the two things they mention is, can we secure the goalkeeper? That's vital, Fraser Forster, because you need a top goalkeeper. How many great and how many you know last ditch saves did he make? Important saves and crucial times of games. Your goalkeeper is huge, by the way. You've got to have a top keeper to progress and to keep going, which we've got. And the other one for me is probably you could probably guess it is is Edward. Um, Edward again, a fantastic young player, been at the club now several years, scooped some awards this year as well. So he'll be flying. But we all know, Andrew, the vultures will be there, mate. The vultures will come. And it's just or not, it's just whether or not Celtic can fend off a £30 million bid or a £35 million bid. Whatever people think he's worth, I haven't got a clue what he's worth. But um, whatever the supporters think he's worth, can Celtic go in for a, an unprecedented 10 titles in a row, never been done before, to create history that will stand for years and years to come, I believe, can they fend off the vultures? I'm hoping they can. I know they're working hard to try and get uh, Edward to stay on because I know he's got a contract. So they are the two things that you know are at the forefront of my mind in terms of the new season. Now, I know he's got defenders you know, to get and things like this. Simonovic has, has left the club. Uh, Johnny Hayes has left the club. So, Neil, 
you know, I know the way he works. He one out, one in type of thing. You know, he doesn't want to leave himself too short. We have got Aya, Aya, who's who's been in the papers as well. Hopefully, we can keep out all of our best players. We've got some incredibly young players like McGregor, like Forrest, uh, Mikey Johnson. You know, I've mentioned them, Frimpong. You know, and we just need to hold on to everybody, and everybody needs to get on board and try and get this ten in a row. And that's what this is where Neil now will earn his money in terms of discussing what they can do, uh, look at their recruitment. Yes, we need bodies, we need quality players to come in, we need to strengthen. But I think what's imperative is is holding on to them two big names that I've just mentioned. I don't know what your thoughts are, Andrew, but them two players are at the forefront of my mind when you talk about Celtic being strong again next season. Well, they were both standout players last season, that's for sure. And he's just, his coolness, he seems to have a, a really good attitude. And big Fraser coming back as well. And made a, He made, as you said, he made some great saves. What a great shot stopper he is. I hear whispers that his Jeep has been seen in Lennox Town. So hopefully, um, it's going to be hard to keep up because Premier League players, they don't come cheap. And I wouldn't imagine the package is too cheap either to bring them. But you've signalled out, even with Forrest and McGregor, and I suppose you can't leave Scott Brown out of that because his, his leadership has been incredible. But John, um, just just go back to the Lee Griffiths thing now. Um, that would mean a lot to Lee if he heard you speak like that because you had your off uh, field problems, which you overcame. And uh, you never miss game time, but, and you've sorted out, obviously you had a gambling problem. And you, I know you're an inspiration to many, many young gamblers to, to go to rehab and, and get their life back together and get, get away from the bookies. So I'd just like to commend you on that. And also on your charity work, John, which is phenomenal, the amount of money you raised through the John Hardson Foundation. Yes, well, you know, I, I had conversations with Lee when, um, when it all broke that um, he was, he needed a bit of help. And sometimes, Andrew, it's, it's not always easy to admit when you're a famous person and you're in a bit of a bubble. Uh, you don't want negative headlines. You don't want people to know. You keep things in. Um, and we know the importance of talking and letting it out, um, mental health, all these things. But the one thing he did do was he, he said that he was struggling and um, you could clearly see that he needed a bit of help. And um, that's why I think that uh, I spoke to Lee and I actually offered to mentor Lee. I spoke to Brendan Rogers and Peter Lowell. And um, I had a long chat with Peter Lowell and I said to Peter, Peter will second this. I said, Peter, you know, you knew me when you when when I was a player. And, uh, you know, we're, we're not all Michael Owens, you know, we're not all Alan Shearer's, if you like. We, it takes It takes a... It takes all kinds to make a team. And that's why Martin was excellent. You know, some of the lads were a bit different to other people. We're all different shapes and sizes. We've all got different characters. We've all got different strengths and weaknesses. And sometimes we're not all robots and we're not all the same. Everybody's different. And because you like a bit of tomato sauce on your chips, that doesn't make you totally different from every other player. And sometimes you've just got to give somebody that little bit of leeway if he's special. In particular, Lee, because Lee is very special. He's very important to the football club. And I, I said to Peter, I said, look, Peter, I said, I can sort of talk with Lee on regular occasions and I could take him to watch games through the week and talk to him and, and just be like somebody that he could trust and he could rely on. But the club decided to go their own route and they've done a very good job in terms of the way that they've gone. But I'll always, I'm always there. The club know that. If anybody, you know, anybody's got an issue with gambling or whatever, you know, I'm an example that I've got myself clean and obviously I'm there to support anybody, not just from Celtic. Because nine years ago when I was in disarray living in Wales, and I had no money and I, I was I was getting down and I was struggling, you know, mentally. And when I went to GA, somebody, you know, held their hand out to me. Somebody offered me their help. And um, I'm there now to, off, to offer my hand out if anybody wants any help. Because that was important to me when I went that 
somebody were there and, and, and we were all the same. We were all, we were all problem gamblers. Um, it's like a fellowship. It's like a trust. And, and, and that's, that's what I offered to do with Lee. But the club decided to, as I said, they had plans for him. And, and you know, they, they've done great work with him. And Lee's also responded to it as well. But um, the point I'm trying to make is, Andrew, because you're footballers, people tend to think that you don't have problems and, you know, you, you, don't, you don't deal with every other thing that other people do, deals with on a regular basis, the general public. You know, I, I was from quite a rough council estate in Swansea and it was every man for himself growing up. You know, you had to fend for yourself and it wasn't for the faint-hearted. And, you know, a lot of the guys, a lot of my mates are still mates that I grew up with. You know, the fact that I'm a footballer, an ex-footballer, doesn't mean so all my mates are footballers. And the point I'm trying to make is, is that sometimes, you know, people cut you down and, and speak badly of you because you make mistakes and you're this and you're that. Because you're put on a pedestal, you know, but they, they, they tend to forget that you're just a human being and you make mistakes and you go through life and you have problems, marital problems, gambling problems, drinking problems. You go and see the Tony Adams Clinic in Forest Mayor in Southampton, Sporting Chance. It's full of young athletes with problems, with issues. And sometimes you just, you're just normal and you just need that little bit of help and you need that little bit of guidance and get, just get yourself back on track. And, and that's what you need sometimes because you're just normal. You're just normal, although you're a footballer and it's great. You've achieved your goals and you've achieved your dreams as a young boy. You know, sometimes you do mess up, but it's important then that you've got people to support you. And, and that's what Celtic have done with Lee. They've supported him. And hopefully now they'll reap the benefits when he comes back with a stronger mind and uh, the great goal scorer that he is. Oh, brilliant, John. Brilliant. So well said. John, you have a great family unit around you these days. I know we're close. Uh, and, and earlier on when, when we were setting up the interview, I, the kids were in, I was chatting to them. No family holiday this year because of the coronavirus for any of us. Uh, now, you're a fluent Welsh speaker and a proud Welsh man. You've played for your country over 50 times and you've also coached the team. So I just have one final question for you. Have you told your wife, Sarah, that she's going to Euro 2021 for her holidays? <laughs> well, Andrew, I had a nice contract with ITV to cover the Euros uh, this year. And uh, it'll happen now in 2021. It's all over Europe, as you know. Um, final is at Wembley. Wales are there. Scotland still have a bit of work to do. Um, so does my team. We, we, we've still two games to get there. Ireland. Yeah, so do Ireland, of course. Changed their manager as well. Yeah, Stephen yeah. Kenny's in now and does... Stephen, yeah, I met Stephen a few times when I was over in... Um, when I was doing work over with uh, Air Sport in Dublin. Stephen would come into the studio sometimes. I wish Stephen well, obviously, in his new role. I'm sure he'd get a lot of support. Damien Duff, of course, has left his role at Celtic to join him. Um, I'm sure that'd be a little bit of a loss, but it's an opportunity for someone, I suppose. But um, no, as I said, I'll enjoy the Euros now next year, uh, all over Europe. Obviously, Wales missed out on the World Cup, but you know this will be uh, 2018. But they had a wonderful 2016 Euros, getting all the way to the semi-final. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to that. Ryan Giggs, you know, uh, he, he qualified for the first tournament that he entered into as manager. So he's done really well. A lot of debate over Ryan, but I think he's swung the crowd around now in his favour uh, because of the qualification, which is great for him on a personal note. But no, there'll be no holiday this year, Andrew, because before we know it, we'll be back into the football, you know. And I think everybody's in the same boat. And, you know, we all love the game. And as long as it's safe to do so, and, um, you know, the government give us the go-ahead, then we have to adhere to what they say and what the uh, the lockdown is and the restrictions and everything else. But once we get a go-ahead, we'll all be ready to go. And looking forward to it. John, you beat Rangers, you beat Cancer. You've been an inspirational guest. And I look forward to maybe doing a night or two with you on the live circuit when the venues are back up and running and the punters are allowed back in. John, thank you so much. 
You're welcome, Andrew. Anytime you know that, mate. You've only got to give me a shout. I love speaking to you, mate. Brilliant. Complete gentleman. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you very much, John Hudson, for joining us. Absolute pleasure to chat to you. And I once again, thank you very much to St. Margaret's Celtic Supporters Club for their kind sponsorship. If you would like to sponsor an episode and you like what you're hearing, please get in contact via our website or through social media. You can also contact us directly by email info at celticfanzine.com. And thank you, the listeners, for tuning in and supporting independent Celtic fan media. Visit celticfanzine.com where you can find daily articles and news on all things Celtic and the Celtic fan base. And you can also purchase the fanzine or visit our online shop where you will find our unique range of t-shirts. Thanks to everybody who has bought a t-shirt or a fanzine since we launched 19 years ago. With your support we can continue to build our independent media Celtic fan platform. Coming up on Friday's episode of the podcast I will be talking to Celtic fan and Sky Sports news editor Anthony Joseph. Many, many years ago, I was standing selling the fanzine in the old coach park in Celtic Park, and a young lad approached me, and he asked me could he write for the fanzine. He was going to journalism college. Well, that was Anthony. Anthony went on to become an award-winning journalist before joining Sky Sports. Over the years, I've bumped into Anthony home and away following Celtic. He's also a member of the Tartan Army, and we've had a few good slagging matches over the years when Ireland play Scotland. Please subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review. You can download the podcast on all platforms, Apple Podcasts, Acast, Spotify, or whichever one you like. And you can also find all the podcasts on our website, celticfanzine.com. And as always, I'd like to thank our producer, Ronan McQuillan. And once again, thank you all for listening. And please keep in contact with us. We've had some great comments and some great emails and texts about what guests you'd like to have on the show or what fans have a story to tell. Keep the faith and most importantly, stay safe. (laughs) 